work in the Department of Pathology here in Cambridge, and I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you all to the Cambridge Immunology uh, and Medicine webinar series. Um, and uh, I'd like to also extend a very warm welcome to our colleagues who are joining us, uh, some of whom are in Uganda through the Cambridge and Africa scheme. So you're very welcome as well. Today, our speaker is uh, Francesco Colucci from the University of Cambridge. Um, and um, Francesco currently works in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynaecology, but um, he is actually originally a medic and qualified in uh, the University of Bari uh, in 91. He then immediately moved to uh, a career in research, uh, starting a PhD at the University of Umea in Sweden, um, working on diabetes. He moved to Paris where he began to work in the Pasteur Institute with Jim DeSanto. And that's really where his interest in NK cells blossomed, which is what he's going to talk about today, um, working on the role of transcription factors and cytokines in NK development, which has been a long standing interest. Um, and while working with Jim, he uh, published the first paper I remember of his, which had the rather um, interesting title of um, what does it take to make an actual killer? Um, in Nature Abuse of Immunology. That's where I first came across his work. Since 2010, he's been, um, sorry, he then moved uh, as principal investigator to Babraham um, and then became interested uh, not only in NK cells in tumor immunology and in particular melanoma, but also began to be interested in the more natural physiological process uh, of pregnancy and the role that NK cells play in placentation. Uh, Recently, Francesco moved to the Department of Obstetrics and Gynae in Cambridge, uh, where he's now a reader. Um, and today he is going to uh, give us a talk about uh, a new topic, which he's uh, been thinking about. An ancient immunoreceptor educates maternal NK cells to optimize reproduction. If I could just before you come in, Francesco, uh, invite everyone, if you have questions, to post them in the chat and we'll try and take those uh, towards the end. Uh, of the talk. Welcome, Francesco. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Thank you, Mariam, for organizing this and welcome to all of the 70 plus participants to this webinar. I should double thank you, uh, thank Andrew, because he's uh, contributed a lot to the work uh, uh, we are going to talk about uh, today. Now, let me start by sharing the screen. I am um, believe you can see it. Andrew, if, if you can give me the okay signal. Looks fine, that's great. Great, Thanks. thank you, Andrew. All right, so let's put things into context. What we're going to talk about today is basically how innate lymphoid cells regulate tissue physiology. Uh, there are many laboratories doing very exciting work across uh, the world. Some are here in Cambridge, and we're learning that these innate lymphocytes, of which natural killer cells are part of, the, of this family, they are very important in uh, regulating, for example, uh, adipose tissue metabolism, uh, the physiology of uh, 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 the lungs from the very first breath at birth, at birth, but also the interaction and the crosstalk with microbes and uh, foods. What we are going to talk about today is how innate lymphoid cells and in particular natural killer cells regulate tissue physiology in the uterus during pregnancy. So we're going to talk about how an ancient receptor on immune cells educates natural killer cells and how this um, helps um, or optimizes pregnancy outcomes. Let's start perhaps with something that most immunologists are not very familiar with, uh, and that is pregnancy outcomes. But basically what we mean is uh, a healthy baby and mom at birth. But normally, when a baby is born, we generally ask how the baby and the mom are. Sometimes we ask the gender. And then the third next question is the birth, birth weight. Now, birth weight is a window on the past and a window on the future of the health of the baby and the future child. What do I mean by this? The birth weight really marks um, um, uh, an important uh, 
a, a, a moment in the life of the child. And uh, within a certain range, we consider the birth weight normal, but uh, a, a baby born too light or too large may uh, uh, actually uh, develop um, a pathology in the future. And that is because during the nine months in the womb, it has probably been under some sort of stress, metabolic stress, and its genome has adapted epigenetically, marking this child for um, uh, um, uh, an, uh, possibly an unhealthy life. What do we mean? Well, as I was saying, within a certain range, say roughly between two and a half and four kilos, um, babies are considered normal, uh, but also babies that are too light or too large may not necessarily be ill. They may uh, uh, be large for gestational age or small for gestational age. That doesn't mean that they are uh, pathological. What matters really is whether the growth of the baby is symmetrical. What do we mean? We mean that, when the resources are scarce, uh, because, for example, the placenta uh, fails to provide all the uh, nourishment that is needed by the fetus, the fetus is going to have a restriction in its growth. And when the resources are scarce, what, what happens is that there are actual vascular um, changes in the brain of the fetus, of the human fetus, so that more blood is redirected to the brain at the expense of the rest of the body. Uh, and uh, this phenomenon is called brain sparing uh, and, and, um, and underlines the asymmetrical uh, growth restriction, whereby the head is large compared to the rest of the body. Now, while this intuitively may seem like a, a useful adaptation, really, and perhaps counterintuitively, uh, it's uh, uh, actually a sign for uh, um, perhaps bad things to come, because it's been shown that babies uh, in which um, in whom uh, the uh, um, brain sparing phenomenon uh, uh, happens, they are more prone, they have a greater chance of developing later in childhood neurological and behavioral abnormalities. <clears throat> now, uh, the National Inst Institute of Child Health now puts birth weight uh, as um, possibly a better predictor of um, cardiovascular disease uh, uh, better than you know, other bad habits like smoking or a bad diet or a sedentary life. So again, birth weight, low birth weight can predispose to cardiovascular disease. And the World Health Organization states that um, as much as 10% of the global burden of disease is due to perinatal morbidity of mother and baby, meaning that uh, what happens during uh, 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 fetal growth and the childbirth may underline as much as 10% of all disease in the world. So we can sort of pat ourselves in the back uh, because what we are doing at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and, and Pathology goes really beyond uh, uh, obstetrics and gynecology and really uh, affects all the realm of uh, uh, um, uh, human health. Now, the last introductory slide on pregnancy complications. One of the most common pregnancy complications is a syndrome called preeclampsia, which affects uh, one in 20 pregnancies worldwide, more uh, in certain ethnicity and certain countries, uh, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa. It can associate with low birth weight. What it is, is a uh, uh, um, um, it, it, it is uh, underlined by high blood pressure and presence of proteins in the urine. Uh, uh, it may um, um, uh, be followed by full-blown eclampsia, which is really uh, seizures um, leading to death unless the placenta is not delivered. So it's really a syndrome caused by uh, uh, the placenta and not the baby. Um, it really still today takes too many uh, lives of mothers and, and babies across the world. Uh, we don't know the etiology of this disease, but for sure it's multifactorial. There is some genetic component 
because it runs in family. And the immune system is implicated in the pathogenesis, uh, although not very clearly, and I'm happy to discuss this later, perhaps in the question and answer um, uh, time. Now, okay, what about education of the immune system? I've noticed that there are non-immunologists in the part in the in the in the audience so you're very welcome i don't want to overwhelm you with a lot of three letters acronyms but what do we mean by education in the immune system uh, there are many ways of educating uh, our immune system one is through foods for example and interaction with microbes uh, microbiota or germs and this is not what we are going to talk about today although it is very important and we are we have a, a research program in the laboratory where we're looking at the effect of infections on the immune system of uh, pregnant uh, females and how this may affect fetal growth. We're not going to talk about this uh, aspect of uh, immune system education. What we are going to talk about is a genetically determined ability of the immune self to learn the discrimination between self and non-self. This is a classical uh, way uh, of uh, uh, functioning of the immune system, which has different nuances and, and different flavors. And there are some complementary theories like the dangerous theory, but we don't need to go into the details of that. All we need to know is that at the center of this uh, self-recognition, is a major histocompatibility complex uh, genes, which are these very variable and um, polygenic uh, genes that uh, we inherit and mine are very different from all of you. We the 73 of us will have all a different combination of MHC genes uh, and we only share um, uh, half of these genes with our parents and siblings and the only way of having uh, this identical uh, um, uh, genetic ID is with identical twins. Now, immune cells develop in the body to recognize self, to avoid attacking it, and they will attack a non-self, so a pathogen and so forth. So perhaps a good way to start before we talk about natural killer cell education is to talk about T-cell education, which uh, most uh, biologists are familiar with. T-cell education is also known, of course, in, in, in textbooks as T-cell selection. We all know that the T-cells have to um, go to a school, which is the thymus at a certain time of their life, so early in ontogeny, and they have to um, uh, rearrange a T-cell receptor that must have intermediate affinity for self-MHC. T cells that have too high affinity or too low affinity are killed off. And only 1% of the lucky T cells that happen to have an intermediate in affinity with the self-MHC are selected. They're allowed to go in the periphery. They stay around for all lifelong until they meet their match, which is a, a for example, a viral peptide, or in some other uh, situations, if there is a, a tissue graft, they will recognize an allogeneic MHC and attack it immediately. All right, now let's look at NK cell education. It's a little bit more complicated, but there are some similarities. The major similarity is that uh, a major histocompatibility complex determines also N NK cell education. And NK cells uh, <clears throat> um, express a broad range of receptors. Some are variable, some are not variable. But the main difference with the T cells is that the receptors which mediate self-recognition and education are now inhibitory receptors. They are not activating receptor like the T cell receptor. They are not the gas pedal, they're more like the brake pedal. And what they do, these receptors send a signal which is not really well characterized and we are working on it, as well as other laboratories. And this signal teaches the uh, NK cells to be tolerant of self. So basically the NK cells learns the don't kill me signal, uh, but also it allows this cell to spring into action uh, if that MHC would be downregulated, which is something that commonly happens during a viral infection or tumor transformation. So the first difference is that inhibitory receptor mediate self-recognition and education. The second difference is that 
And K cells, which happen to express receptors that don't bind to self mhc they are not killed off, but they're allowed to stay around in the body and they may come useful uh, because they may be still activated by bystander cytokines during an infection, for example. And the third difference is that in case cell education doesn't happen in a precise place like 40 cells in the thymus or time. We actually don't really know where, where it happens, perhaps in the bone marrow and in the secondary lymphoid organs. Uh, uh, so it doesn't have a specific place and it doesn't have a specific time either. We know, uh, based on evidence coming from transplantation, that NK cells can adapt to a new MHC without necessarily being uh, uh, readily activated like T cells. So, which means is that is the, so this means that NK cell education is a sort of continuing education also in adult life, and NK cells can adapt to new environment. Obviously, this is very relevant when we think about pregnancy, which is this natural transplantation, or we should say implantation, where paternal MHC, which are uh, mismatched MHC, will be expressed on the trophoblast. And the question we're asking is what are these uh, new? MHC going to do to NK cells? Are they going to educate them? Are they going to activate them? And so forth. Now, what, what is this uh, ancient immunoreceptor we're going to talk about? Well, it's uh, a receptor, I uh, uh, apologize for the uh, name, which is a mouthful, but uh, uh, it's a, a dimer composed of CD94 and NKG2A. This is an, an ancient receptor, um, we'll look into that in a second, um, uh, that is not variable. Mine is the same as yours, okay? Contrary to a lot of other immunoreceptors, this is constant. All people will have the same receptor, and actually mice and, and rats will have a very similar receptor. And um, what it binds to is HLA-E, which is a non-classical uh, MHC class one. Another one that is not variable. There are two alleles known in all uh, uh, humanity, while there are thousands of HLA A or B or C, okay? And this <clears throat> HLA E is the oldest known class one isotype. Uh, mouse, uh, the mouse uh, ligand is uh, slightly different from HLA E, but it's ortholog and it's called QA1, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, according to Peter Parham, so we can trust uh, this, uh, this ligand, re ligand receptor interaction existed in a common ancestor of primates and rodents, which means some 80 million years ago before the radiation of mammalian species. And that means that most placental mammals have orthologs of CD94 and KG2A and QA1 or HLA-E. So uh, when I give my lectures, I um, say to the students, this is a, a sort of a dinosaur receptor. That doesn't mean that, uh, you know, we don't know if dinosaurs had this receptor, but we do know that animals living at the time of dinosaurs did have this receptor and this receptor ligand interaction. Now, exactly how ancient this receptor is, we don't really know, but it may uh, go even further back in, the, in natural history because uh, elegant research from other group, particularly this one here in Israel, has shown that there are homologs of mammalian, mammalian NK cell receptors uh, that we find um, uh, homologs in invertebrates like Siona intestinalis or Botrylus schlosseri. Um, so this is very fascinating. Uh, in, in, invertebrates, which clearly don't have a placenta, which clearly reproduce in different way, may have this ancient uh, uh, receptor. Now, I have to tell you a little bit of uh, background uh, 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 that um, uh, is linked to a beautiful paper pub published by our uh, collaborator, Amir Horowitz, uh, about five years ago, when he was in, at Stanford with Peter Pan. Now he's got his own laboratory in New York. And what he showed was that um, NK cell education uh, is basically uh, in, imparted by two different schools. What did this mean? Well, it means that uh, in certain individual, uh, the um, ancient and highly conserved HLA-E 
and KG2A interaction will provide education uh, through this old school, old because it is uh, evolutionarily ancient. Now, you will forgive me for shortening this to NKG2A. Sometimes when I refer to NKG2A, I will refer to the dimer CD94 NKG2A. So this is an invariant and conserved interaction. And some of us will preferentially use this <clears throat> pathway to educate our NK cells. Uh, Others, people, uh, more than 50, perhaps 60%, depending on the uh, ethnic group, will instead preferentially use the new school of NK cell education, uh, which is based on the interaction of killer cell immunoglobulin-like receptors, known as KIR, with the more variable HLA, A, B, and C uh, allotypes. Now, the KIR receptors are also themselves very variable, only second to the HLA molecules. So these interactions create a, uh, basically unique, you know, individual interactions uh, that lead to uh, uh, NK cell education in certain people. Now, <clears throat> as I was saying, not everyone can educate NK cells through NKG2A, through this ancient receptor. What does it mean? Well, the decision really is made by a single amino acid dimorphism as position minus 28, sorry, 21 of HLA-B, okay? Now, let's see, uh, uh, let's see why. Now, HLA-E, in order to be expressed on the cell surface, requires the leader sequence of classical HLA molecules, like, for example, HLA-B. This leader sequence may have um, methionine at position minus 21, in which case it will provide a, a functional productive peptide for HLAE to be expressed on the surface. So HLAE can interact with NKG2A, right? And NK cells in those individuals will be preferentially educated through NKG2A and the old school. However, if that amino acid at position minus 21 is threonine, the peptide will not be good enough for HLAE to go on the surface. Very little HLAE will go on the surface. NKG2A will fail to educate NK cells. And for um, reasons that I'm happy to discuss later with you, uh, uh, the NK cell education will go mostly through uh, the key receptors. Okay, so uh, what we have said so far before we delve into the results is that birth weight matters. We have also said that NK cell education through can happen through NKG2A or KIR, and this is determined by HLAB dimorphism, just a single amino acid, uh, and roughly maybe half of the population, a bit less, can educate uh, NK cells through NKG2A, and the other half, or 60%, will not be able to. Now, how do we measure NK cell education in the laboratory? So say, for example, if we take a blood sample from any donor, we can um, do our uh, you know, uh, bread and butter technology of immunologists, which is flow cytometry. We can gate on natural killer cells and uh, culture them for just a couple of hours in medium alone or with a certain stimulus. Uh, and then we measure the uh, number of, of frequency of cells that respond in terms of cytokine production, for example, interferon gamma, or degranulation, which is uh, this marker called CD107, is a, a, a signature of a killer cell, a cell that has been able to degranulate uh, cytotoxic molecules. And in this particular uh, uh, person, this particular donor, the cells that we deem to be educated are the NK cells that express NKG2A and or KIR. So every single NK cell will be able to express NKG2A uh, or not, and they will express a combination or an assortment of the up to 14 KIR genes that they have inherited by their father or the 14 or so from their mother. So every single cell will have uh, um, NKG2A and or KIR or none of these receptors. And it 
ends up that in this donor, 87% uh, of cells have the potential to be educated. Why? Because they express inhibitory receptors that can bind to self-MHC. And this functionally translates, if we look at the cells that are stimulated, and if we look at the cells that do express those receptors, we can see that they respond more than the cells that do not express those inhibitory receptors. All right? So, Education uh, translates in a laboratory assay, in a simple laboratory assay, in a, a better performance, better functional performance. Now, what about uh, NKG2A in the uterus? We're coming closer to the, uh, uh, the subject of our talk. And I, I have to uh, say that um, uh, um, Andrew did, did a lovely work, which was published now six years ago. This was the first ever paper uh, investigating uh, uh, NK cell education in any tissue, because uh, there is a lot of interest as I was saying at the very beginning, innate lymphoid cells regulate the physiology of all our tissues. And so there is a lot of interest in how NK cell education is regulating in the liver, in the adipose tissue, in the tumor microenvironment. And Andrew was the first one to look at uh, uh, tissue specific education of decidual or uterine NK cells. I will use uh, decidual and uterine uh, interchangeably. And the uh, uh, um, Peculiarity here uh, uh, is that while about 40, sometimes 50% of the blood NK cells, peripheral blood NK cells, do express NKG2A, uh, nearly all or 95% of uterine NK cells express this ancient receptor NKG2A. Now, uh, can we study this in the mouse? Well, yes, we can. Now in the mouse, uh, uh, the situation is a little bit different because when we look at the uterine and K cells, 50% uh, of them, 40 or 50 express uh, uh, NKG2A. And so you have a natural comparison between the cells that do express the receptor and the, those that do not. And what we have seen in a paper that is going to be published um, uh, next month, but is published now online from, uh, from last month, a, a work done by Norman Shreve in the laboratory has shown that NK cells that in the mouse, in the uterus of the mouse that do express NKG2A, they respond more than NK cells that do not express NKG2A. So when we ask those cells if they could produce interferon gamma, we saw that NKG2A positive uh, cells, so educated cells, would produce more interferon gamma. Now, I should uh, say that interferon gamma is the key cytokine in mouse um, to uh, be needed for the vascular remodeling in, in, in the uterus in order for a normal placentation and fetal growth. We'll go back to this in a second. Now, um, the key analog in mice is LY49. It's a group of receptors called LY49. And we saw that they did not affect uh, the, um, the, 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 the way NKG2A was educating NK cells. What we did see, however, is that a marker, a surrogate marker of NK cell education, which is the adhesion molecule DNAM1, was uh, higher on uh, educated NK cells than on non educated. And this was uh, uh, work done by Delphine de Pierrot in the lab, which was important to confirm uh, somehow that uh, NKG2A positive cells are more educated than NKG2A negative cells. Now, what I should have told you perhaps before is what do NK cells do really? Um, the real answer, you know, the honest answer is we don't know exactly, but we have a good idea. Now, this is a beautiful picture that looks like a wonderful tree here, which is actually a cross section of a mouse implantation site at mid gestation taken by Zosha Madeja and published now 10 years ago uh, in, in uh, her paper. Uh, here we would have the fetus and mid gestation. This is the trophoblast. So the cells that are going to form the placenta, the placenta is not formed yet. We are about a couple of days before the placenta is formed, but the trophoblast does invade deep into the uterus, although this invasion is much shallower than in humans. And here you see the uterine the decidua and the uterine wall, which is really seeded by a lot of uh, uterine and, uh, NK cells. They are all over uh, the tissue here. So for 
uh, we're sure that there are interactions happening between maternal NK cells and trophoblast cells, which are made by the fetus. Now, these are also um, beautiful sections provided by Lucy Gardner in Ashley Moffitt's lab, and again by Zosha in human and mouse to show that despite the big differences in uh, reproductive biology in humans and mice, there are some similarities, and one of one similarity is that we find uterine K cells where and when the trophoblast uh, uh, invade, so during pregnancy. Another similarity in both human and mice is that we see a lot of uterine K cells around uterine vessels, mostly arteries around or even inside, in both human and mice. So, <clears throat> so we think we think that. Um, an, Uterine NK cells together with the trophoblast form a partnership uh, and uh, which uh, uh, is important to uh, then um, uh, generate factors that change the physiology of these vessels that become large conduits and allow constant uh, blood flow to the placenta and the fetus. So uh, um, uh, in a beautiful review by Nabil Jabran Ferrat a couple of years ago, it's uh, made clear that NK cells can be very different in their phenotype. If we look at, say, what we call conventional NK cells, your killer that are found mostly in the blood and the tissue NK cells, mostly in the decidua, uterine NK cells, uh, uh, because these cells are mostly helper. They are also being called builders because they do not kill actually, but they uh, help uh, tissue homeostasis. Now, uh, uh, this, this paper, which we published uh, now five years ago, uh, shows that in a mouse model, uh, lacking a transcription factor, which is important, which is essential for the development of certain innate lymphoid cells, including subsets of uterine and K cells, what we saw was that uh, um, we saw suboptimal vascular adaptation in pregnancy and a consequence on the uh, fetal weight at a uh, 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 term. This is just one day before the mice are born. So this can be really related to birth weight in humans. And what we saw was that um, uh, at the end of pregnancy, if we looked at fetuses that were born from the knockout mother mated with a wild type father, the fetuses were on average uh, lighter than the fetuses born in a wild type mother um, um, mated with a wild type father. Okay, so the uh, natural killer cells in the uterus seem to modulate uterine vasculature together with the trophoblast and, um, uh, and promote fetal growth. Now, I should alert you to um, a sort of a complication we are working hard on uh, together with other laboratories, and that is the heterogeneity of natural killer cells. Uh, you know, gone are the days of one. Uh, subset per lineage. We have, of course, many subsets, sub-subsets uh, in, in uh, group one innate lymphoid cells, of which NK cells, also in the uterus. So, for example, if you look in the uterus, we have at least three types of NK-like cells, one that looks like conventional NK cells, one that looks like proper ILC1s, and we will find the corresponding in the liver or um, uh, in other tissues. But what is unique to the uterus is this, what we call the tissue resident NK cells in the mouse uterus, which seem to be very similar to some of the NK cells found in the human uterus. And this is the work that uh, was done by Eva Filipovic uh, now about three years ago during her thesis uh, in our laboratory. Uh, a work that uh, actually um, uh, Andrew and Amir in Ashley's lab together with Peter Parham started and then uh, Oshin uh, Hun uh, um, finalized brilliantly in our laboratory was the identification of human NK cell subsets by mass cytometry, which was uh, published uh, last year. So just bear in mind that there is some heterogeneity, uh, but now comes uh, uh, Norman Shreve, who started his PhD about four years ago, uh, and uh, in between uh, delivering babies at the uh, Rosie, is a young obstetrician, uh, and uh, uh, you know having a family and running international marathons, he also did some science, uh, and. Uh, uh, um, I should say it was the idea of a former member of the lab, uh, Jan, Jens Kikbusch, 
uh, to direct him to look at this ancient receptor because really we wanted to look at the interactions between KIR and HLAC, these very variable receptors which have been sh shown to be important in pregnancy complication and in NK cell biology. And uh, I should stress that there are so many uh, in receptor ligand interactions that we, one can look at and they will most probably affect the physiology of pregnancy and pregnancy complication. But we decided, um, following Jens' suggestion, Norman decided to focus on uh, this ancient uh, interaction between NKG2A and HLAE, right? And the mouse is a good model uh, to look at um, the role of um, uh, uh, NKG2A in uh, uterine NK cell education by self-recognition of maternal MHC. Why? Well, there is a knockout mouse available, uh, which is uh, <clears throat> which was made uh, by uh, our colleagues in Germany, and they uh, kindly shared it with us. The gene coding for NKG2A is called KLRC1, and here you can see that the knockout mice uh, do not express that receptor. <clears throat> Now, uh, um, something that makes things a little bit easier in the mouse is that the trophoblast here, as far as we know, doesn't seem to express the ligand, the QA1. So all the interactions that are going to happen between NKG2A and QA1 are coming from maternal cells, maternal MHC educating uterine NK cells, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, what we I'll tell you what we found first, and then I'll go through the data, uh, uh, was that uh, CD94 and KG2A educates uterine NK cells, uh, and that mice lacking NKG2A, the dams lacking NKG2A, displayed reduced uteroplacental hemodynamic adaptation. And this was checked by beautiful micro dopplers uh, in the mouse. Here you can see the, uh, the fetus head, the umbilical cord with the artery and the veins. Um, and uh, the fetuses uh, born from these uh, uh, knockout mothers showed asymmetrical fetal growth and abdominal brain development. I'll take you through the data in a minute. Uh, and uh, uh, what is also exciting is that we have some evidence that a non-functional NKG2A pathway in humans may expose women to a greater risk of uh, preeclampsia. Okay, so now let's go through the data little by little. Now here, if you take a, a, a section, a cross section of uh, an implantation site and mid gestation, here is the fetus, the amnion, the trophoblast, and here is the decidua where you find NK cells and their interaction with the, vas the vessels, you can uh, start to uh, measure the size of the vessels. You can look at the uh, thickness of the wall and the lumen, uh, and then express this in a ratio to try and understand how um, the vessels are being modified during pregnancy. Now, what we noticed was that if you have a certain ratio between two and four in a female black six, uh, this was much greater in a knockout female because uh, the wall was thicker and the lumen was smaller, suggesting that the adaptations, uh, uh, the vascular adaptations during pregnancy were insufficient in this knockout. Now notice here that how we made the uh, crossing was to mate the females with the male of the reciprocal knockout to have a nice internal control so that the um, babies in uh, both crosses here are genetically identical, no matter what the maternal genotype is, okay? Uh, now, another marker of things changing is the smooth muscle actin, uh, again, at mid-gestation. While in a black six mouse, you're expected to see uh, the smooth muscle actin staining fading away because most probably the interferon gamma produced by NK cells stimulates macrophages uh, to degrade the smooth muscle actin of the arteries. This was not um, uh, was done to a, a less extent in the knockout female, suggesting that again, this was another indication that the vascular remodeling was insufficient. Uh, but as I told you, uh, Norman uh, is a young obstetrician and he 
sort of didn't, um, wasn't satisfied by this uh, histological assessment. He really wanted to do what is done in humans, which is Dopplers. And so he went to uh, John uh, Sled in, in uh, Toronto to learn uh, uh, this micro Doppler technique in such small animals and produced results looking at uh, the left uterine artery, the right uterine artery, um, uh, measuring the um, uh, peak systolic velocity, the end diastolic velocity in the maternal uterine artery, but also, as I was showing you before, in the baby, in the fetus here, you can see the fetal head and the umbilical artery. And what he found was that in the mother, now we're looking at uterine artery, what he found was that in the knockout females, he saw a reduced uh, end diastolic velocity. We'd also an increased resistant index in the knockout. Uh, and uh, so if you look at the ratio of the resistant index in virgin uh, mice, and uh, you compare that to um, pregnant mice of the same genotype, you should have a negative ratio, like it happens in black six wild type females. This doesn't happen in knockout because there is high resistance index, again suggesting that also the hemodynamic uh, is uh, uh, compromised. So not just by taking a snapshot with the sections, but actually looking at the flow dynamics, you can see some defects in the knockout, suggesting that the lack of NK cell education was having a, a downstream a consequence on uh, the vasculature in the uterus of knockout females. Did that have a consequence on blood flow in the babies? Well, when Norman looked at the umbilical artery peak systolic velocity, he noticed that this was uh, slightly but significantly reduced compared to the black six. So what we were seeing in the maternal tissue was having a negative effect also in the uh, babies. They were probably not receiving uh, enough uh, blood. <clears throat> now, of course, the next question is, was that um, affecting fetal growth? And here is three groups of uh, 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 babies, babies that are born from black six, mated with black six, and these are our, um, you know, uh, our uh, benchmark. And then we have the two uh, test groups, one where the, knock, the mother, the female is knockout, and the other one where the female is wild type. And as I was saying before, these two females have been mated with the, the, the male of the reciprocal uh, genotype so that all the babies here are genetically identical. They are heterozygous. And all the, the only difference is the environment in which they uh, grow up. One environment doesn't have NKG2A, and this was the environment where the babies were on average lighter uh, than the black six and the uh, genetic control, okay? Uh, and actually we found uh, more uh, small for gestational age babies in the knockout dams, uh, uh, more uh, babies that were below the 10 centile, okay? And uh, you may remember that small for gestational age doesn't necessarily mean that these babies are pathological. It means that they are small, but they may be small and proportionate, which means that they are, uh, uh, they're fine, they're just small. So Norman wanted to know that, and they also learned Another, I find, impressive technique, which is uh, the ability to um, assess by micro CT scan um, uh, and then uh, rendering in 3D uh, the whole body of the mouse with the resolution power, I think is one micrometer. And you can very carefully measure the volume of the organs of, uh, of your choice, for example, the brain or the length of the growing femurs in the baby. These are babies at uh, 18.5, so these are at term, okay? And then if you measure the ratio between the brain and the femur, the length, you have a proxy of the symmetry of the growth. So um, in wild type mice, you will have a certain ratio of brain to femur. If you have an asymmetric growth, you're expecting to have a lighter baby who actually, uh, uh, which actually might have 
a greater ratio of brain to female because of what of that phenomenon I was uh, mentioning in the beginning, which is called brain sparing. So babies that are struggling to get enough resources because the blood flow is sufficient, is insufficient, they will preferentially direct the blood to the brain at the expense of the rest of the body. So what Norman did was he took uh, babies born from the knockout and babies born from the uh, wild type uh, females and divided them each in two groups, those that are average weight and those that are small. And I should say that in a normal black six litter, which is uh, you know normally of seven babies, there will be some that are average weight, there will be some that are a bit bigger and there will be some that are a bit small. So it's normal to have a, a bit smaller babies than the average. And he wanted to know the ratio between brain and fetus in the small babies born from black six, from normal mice, and the ratio between brain and a femur in babies that were born small from the knockout mother. So the other question, that, in other um, words, the question was, does the lack of one single NK cell receptor, this ancient NK cell receptor in KG2A, does it have an effect on how the brain of these mice develop? And obviously the answer is yes, otherwise I wouldn't have gone to uh, such uh, length. So if we look first at the small babies born from the black six, here we see that uh, the small babies had a proportionally smaller brain. So the ratio between the brain and the, um, and the femurs, uh, there is some variation of course, but uh, uh, there is no significant difference. Uh, when we compare the small babies and the average babies. However, when we compare the small babies from the knockout female with the average babies from the knockout female, we see that the ratio is actually significantly increased compared to the, to the black six because the brain is significantly uh, greater uh, proportionally. I can show you the data later if you want to. So essentially, uh, the lack of NKG2A was causing an asymmetrical fetal growth with brain sparing in the pups of NKG2A deficient dams. Now, what we did also was uh, we wanted to know whether the placenta had uh, uh, anything to do with this, because the placenta, which is made by the babies, um, responds to uh, uh, potentially a stressful environment. And we can consider that an environment lacking NKG2A may be stressful because it doesn't provide the necessary factors for the vasculature to adapt and therefore to nourish the uh, baby through a normal blood flow. So what Norman did was he uh, took uh, uh, 10 babies from the black six and 10 babies from the knockouts, took the placentas. Remember that these placentas are genetically identical because of the cross with the reciprocal genotype. And uh, all we found as difference was 19 differentially expressed genes by RNA sequencing. These are the genes that came up either uh, 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 overexpressed or less expressed in the placentas of uh, babies born from the knockouts. Now, I must confess that we haven't followed up this uh, uh, much. We don't know the exact meaning of these differences, uh, but by doing a pathway enrichment analysis using the differentially expressed genes with a false discovery rate of, uh, uh, you know, one percent, uh, we know that uh, genes involved in translation, RNA metabolism, and biosynthetic processes may be uh, upregulated or downregulated in response to this stress caused by lack of NK cell education through this ancient receptor. So basically, uh, the placental transcriptome is influenced by the maternal uh, uh, ancient receptor. <clears throat> now, this is very exciting and all good, but does it matter to people? Does the NKG2A pathway matter in human pregnancy? And we were lucky to have access to a, a data set um, uh, from the Sanger Institute. Andrew was instrumental here, and John Perry also at the uh, MRC Epidemiology Unit. Uh, uh, James Traherne helped, and uh, Ula Sovi also helped us with the uh, stats. And basically, we had uh, access to a meta GWAS analysis of over 150,000 pregnancies uh, in Europeans and uh, Central Asians. And these included about seven, more than 7,000 cases of preeclampsia. You may remember, 
that people may either educate NK cells through NKG2A if they have methionine, or they can educate NK cells through care if they have threonine. And as I said, it's generally 40 to 60%, but there are variations according to uh, ethnicity. Uh, and there is a SNP that can report on whether uh, people have methionine or threonine. And so uh, this was rather straightforward to do. And it came up that um, women, women uh, that had the uh, threonine, so that educate less through NKG2A, they were actually exposed to a 7% greater relative risk of developing preeclampsia. This is the, I'm always amazed to see how data from 150,000 people are really distilled down in a very simple table. And this simple table tell us two things. What I've just told you that we saw a significance of the G allele, which codes for threonine, which is, uh, um, um, uh, uh, which gives, uh, a, a, which exposes women to a greater risk of preeclampsia. But it also tells us that we did not reproduce that result in a sort of smallish cohort of uh, Central Asians. So there is possibly differences in uh, different ethnic groups as to what is the impact of the NKG2A pathway in the context of different immunogenetics in different populations. So this has to be uh, tested in uh, other populations and we have the opportunity to do it um, in Africans and uh, in other cohorts. Uh, but now to conclude, what is the meaning of NKSL education in real life? And to know the meaning of NKSL education in real life, you can Google it or you can PubMed it, and you can find 1,310 papers published since 2005 when NKSL education was discovered, uh, but really no paper reports, uh, sort of a physiological raison d'etre uh, for NK cell education. We don't know what the physiological role of NK cell education is. And really, you may remember that I told you that non-educated NK cells are allowed to stay in the body and they may be helpful in certain situations. And really, there are instances where non-educated NK cells actually do better. So this paper published in Nature Immunology uh, 11 years ago by the group of Louis Lanier showed that unlicensed, licensed is another word to say, excuse me, educated NK cells, they actually dominated the response to an important viral infection, which is the cytomegalovirus infection. So what they did was they infected wild type mice and beta 2M knockout mice. These are the mice that don't have MHC, so they cannot educate NK cells, they cannot educate NK cells. And then they measured viral titers in the salivary glands. And as you can see, the beta 2M knockout mice that cannot educate NK cells, they had lower titers, so they had stronger response. This is uh, uh, understandable because the signal that gives education is the same that may get in the way of NK cell activation if the MHC is still there engaging an inhibitory receptor. So there is an explanation for that. And there are instances also in humans, particularly in cancer patients, where uneducated NK cells may be more useful if, for example, they are activated through their FC receptor, uh, the CD16, uh, through um, uh, uh, antibodies that direct that are directed against tumor antigens. But that's another thing that we can discuss later if you want. So there is a reason to think that uneducated NK cells may actually be useful. So shall we go with the Pink Floyd and uh, dismiss the whole thing about NK cell education? Does it really matter? Do we need it? Actually, we think we do because now there is uh, uh, coming, you know, um, uh, evidence, emerging evidence uh, that NK cell education may be important in HIV control. Is a beautiful work by uh, Mary Carrington Group, published three years ago in Science. In immunotherapy of patients with leukemia, this is a, a group by a, a paper by a Swedish group um, uh, and uh, Ellen. Um, Benson, who is a postdoc in our group, also is a co-author in this paper. Amir Horowitz, our collaborator, has shown that this may be important also for graft versus host disease. And now Norman Shreve and all our co-authors have shown, we have shown that NKCL education is important for fetal growth, brain development, and pregnancy outcome. Perhaps suggesting that NKCL education has its place in physiology in reproduction. So to conclude, this is what I've shown you today, that the ancient and conserved CD94 and KG2A educates uterine NK cells, 
NKG2A deficient dams display reduced uteroplacental hemodynamic adaptation, and their babies have asymmetric fetal growth restriction with abnormal brain development. And in humans, a non-functional NKG2A pathway exposes women to greater preeclampsia risk. Now, um, you may know that Socrates' mother, Fenerate, was a midwife. And um, I'm sure she would be very proud of uh, her son, who, uh, because one of his um, uh, preferred mantra was know yourself. And uh, so they would have been pleased to know that education of NK cells through self-recognition matters for optimal pregnancy. I would uh, leave it there by thanking uh, particularly Norman Shreve, which did most of the work which I've uh, um, presented. Uh, Delphine Depiro, who is um, a, a recent addition to the team, was instrumental in getting the paper over the line. I want to thank also Jens Kickbush for giving us the idea of looking at this ancient receptor. Now Jens uh, is working at the Wellcome Trust. Uh, uh, I would like to um, uh, thank the rest of the team. Uh, two of these members now have gone on to work at the Karolinska. Uh, and I would like to thank also the funding bodies and uh, all the collaborators uh, and you for your attention. Thanks very much. Thanks very much then, uh, Francesco. Uh, lovely to sit with, see that coming together now. Um, it has been a while that we've worked on this and talked about it. So there are some great uh, questions just beginning to sort of come along and it's uh, straight away, uh, the first one is one that you and I and others have discussed for quite a while. Does the body have NK memory, which is uh, a characteristic of adaptive immunity and yet we think of NK cells as having innate immunity. So it's a great question because the few people in Cambridge who work on NK cells do discuss this, as does the rest of the community. So the, the short answer is yes. It's now undeniable that NK cells have uh, um, a form of memory, like other innate immune cells. Some people refer to it as uh, uh, trained uh, responses, mm -hmm. or it's clear that there are epigenetic changes in key genes like the interferon gamma gene which become more accessible. And so in a secondary response, NK cells can respond more efficiently. Uh, if there is time, I'd like to um, say two things. One is that it's clear in mice and humans that there are memory NK cells. They can be, uh, they are characterized by specific markers uh, and uh, uh, there are some differences. Uh, and then another thing I'd like to say is that um, we, know from the work of Ofer Mandelboim in Jerusalem that there are uh, maybe cells that actually remember even pregnancy and we can discuss more about this. So yes, there are memory NK cells, even in the uterus perhaps. Okay, in fact, that was one of the next questions. Do, you know, do uterine NK cells self-renew uh, uh, after a pregnancy and have impact on subsequent pregnancies? And you, you've just uh, You've just uh, sort of addressed that to some degree. Yeah. It, it might be worth just perhaps for people who, who don't work on NK cells so much, um, talking a little bit about what we mean by NK memory. You said epigenetic modification of things like interferon gamma, but in CMV, there are expansion in mm -hmm. blood in particular of certain NK subsets uh, in response to the infection, which then persist. So do you want to just speak a little bit more about that form of NK memory. So it in analogous, my, it's yeah, analogous so, to a clonal expansion, isn't yeah. it? So, so yeah, as you alluded to, Andrew, the, 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 the sort of the classical way of looking at uh, memory has been uh, to viral infection, particularly cytomegalovirus in both humans and mice. And in both humans and mice, you can track the expansion of uh, some basically clones of natural killer cells uh, by using different markers, but with the same functional relevance in humans and mice. And what is clear, particularly in mice, is that if you uh, stimulate again the cells in a secondary response, they will respond quicker and more powerfully. Uh, so that's something that might be exploited also for uh, vaccinology. Okay, um, a, a kind of a related question here um, from one of the, the uh, uh, attendees. Are there varying levels of NK cell education in humans? Um, 
And is it therefore important in clinical management to understand whether mother's NK, G2A positive cells are educated or not? Does that help predict their risk of preeclampsia? And to some extent, you've addressed that a bit. Um, so I would love to say yes, but I don't think we have uh, enough uh, statistical power, predicting power. You, you know, if you notice, uh, I'm talking to the audience, uh, we detected a 7% relative risk, which means, you know, there is 93% noise, <laughs> if you want. But that's not uh, um, depressing, uh, because if you think about the strongest impact of any gene in preeclampsia, in, in pathogenesis of preeclampsia, it's going to be genes that have to do with uh, uh, blood control of blood pressure, and they can get up to 10, 12% relative risk. So we are not that far, we're in the same league. This gene is going to be important, but it's definitely too weak as a predictive power. Uh, we have uh, basically um, hit the same wall, if you want, uh, with uh, the beautiful work that Sue Hebe started in Ashley Moffitt lab with uh, KIR and HLA, which are very variable. And at some point we were very excited because we thought that perhaps by knowing the exact genes of the partner and the mother, we may predict the, um, uh, 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 the risk of preeclampsia. But the predictive power is clinically um, uh, uh, weak. Uh, however, it may be included in algorithms uh, with other factors to help predicting. And this has been done in mathematical models by Olam, Shazara, and other people, other labs. Uh, so I think we're going into the right, right direction. Yeah, that's, I think that's definitely the way it's going, isn't it? Is using it with other biomarkers yeah. to come up with a, with a risk score. Um, yeah. uh, perhaps we've got time for uh, one or two more questions, obviously, if people need to leave. Um, but if you'd like to sort of hang on, we can go for another couple of minutes. Um, and yeah. what are the, someone's asking, what are the implications of training NK cells um, for, or uterine NK cells, or I was going to ask tissue NK cells in other tissues for biotechnology companies trying to develop uh, NK cell therapies? Uh, I know you've thought about, for example, translational medicine to look at NK yeah. interactions with tumors, uh, and yeah. solid tumors in particular. So <clears throat> it's clearly very early days for pregnancy, but it's very exciting. If you have uh, trained cells, can you use them? Um, so that, that there is potential there. But um, for tumors, uh, it's really, I mean, what's happening now in many laboratories and clinics where they're using NK cells in the therapy, they're really uh, uh, going for these adaptive uh, cells, these memory cells, um, which have a stronger uh, reactivity. Um, so they are really very much used in, uh, in, um, in, in to treat uh, certain cancers in patients. What I mean is, if you have cells that have become trained to CMV, for example, in CMV positive people, they have a much better chance to react against a tumor. So you don't really need the same antigen specificity as you would for T cells. So you can uh, sort of uh, co-opt these cells that have uh, uh, been trained towards the virus because they're general reactivity is stronger and you can use that uh, with technology uh, in immuno cellular immunotherapy of cancer patients. Okay, um, uh, we're just in risk of going over sort of more than five minutes. So I'm gonna just take one more question here from Chrissy Lim. Um, what cell types in the decidua uh, or the uterus in general might NK cells interact with and being uh, and affect other than trophoblasts that you've talked about? Uh, so, Good question, thank you. We know that, uh, um, uh, you know, there is this um, now single cell RNA sequencing approach or other like mass cytometry, which we have done, which allows you to look at many different interactions. So in brief, uh, NK cells can interact with uh, blood vessels, cells of blood vessels, endothelial cells, cells of the um, stromal cells, the glands in the uterus, anything really. And we know that quite confidently because by looking at the genes, the subsets of NK cells express in mice or humans, we know that they express the receptors that allow them to engage with ligands expressed in different cell types in the uterus. So they're really at the center of the action. I forgot to mention other leukocytes in, in the uterus like macrophages, which are very important in any tissue. So yeah. 
Okay, uh, I think the key problem will be working out which of those interactions are critical other than the trophoblast. So um, I just think we probably ought to stop there, Francesco. We're, we're uh, just uh, five past uh, two or so. Um, I'd like to thank you very much uh, again on behalf of us all for such an interesting talk. Uh, and I'm sure that if you have uh, in the audience any other questions uh, or further discussion you want to have with Francesco, uh, he'd be happy to respond uh, to emails. So thanks very much again, Francesco. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. And thank you. goodbye to everyone. Hope you enjoyed the talk. Bye-bye.